All right. Well, here we are again. Thankful the Lord is blessed in the week and uh, allowed us to be able to come back together. Um, I told, of course, the, the group this morning that uh, I did let the landlord know that we are going to renew the lease. I do have it signed. I just have to get it scanned and uh, mailed back to them. So <clears throat> we're well under our way and uh, thankful to know the Lord has opened uh, that door. So uh, our current lease will get us through the end of March and then the new lease will take us two years beyond that. So uh, once I get this sent in and they get it signed, uh, we should have this facility until March 31st of 2025. All right. <clears throat> we today are going to be back in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 20. We are still not to uh, some more Old Testament scriptures, but we are um, wanting to finish out this chapter. There's some interesting things that happen. And... I have to admit, this time through the book of Matthew, I'm not picking on the disciples and the apostles. I'm trying to think of how I want to word this. I've noticed the, the um, humanity of the disciples and the apostles more this time through the book of Matthew, right? I think it's because we're going through it chapter by chapter, but uh, th these are the guys that the Lord has had to tell Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, you, you like the things of man more than you like the things of God. He's had to talk to them about the fact that they were arguing over which one of them was going to be greater in the kingdom of heaven. Um, it, there's just been this list of things that as you've looked at it, you can tell they've grown, you can tell that they're faithful, but they're like us. <laughs> they have their faults and their failures. And uh, I think at this point... They're still learning, and I actually see a big change in a lot of them after the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the fulfilling of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I think they had a lot, of, uh, a lot of learning and maturing that they still had to do. We actually talked, of course, about um, the, the chapter 20 is really a continuation of what started in chapter 19, where the rich young ruler talks about what it is that he has to do uh, to uh, earn eternal life. And of course, we see that the Lord challenges him. And the Lord isn't really telling him, if you forsake all, that I'll, you, know, you can earn your salvation. He's challenging him because he knows what he struggles with. Um, but in the course of that, the apostles hear this thing about, um, you know, forsake all and follow me. And then Peter says, well, what about us that forsook you or forsook all and followed you? What do we get? And that's when you start this whole conversation about the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And that's where this story of the labor. And then, of course, we talked about this morning. We made it through a whole three verses. Jesus foretelling his death. Right. He's already this is the third time he's been telling his disciples this. But the first time it was just some future thing. The second time they were in Galilee and it was going to be something that would happen in Jerusalem. This one occurs while they are walking to Jerusalem. Literally, they are on their way to Jerusalem. And the Lord says, behold, here's what's going to happen. And literally this morning we ticked off, right? Everything that he said, his prophecy was so perfect. I'm going to be betrayed to the scribes and the Pharisees, or to the chief priests. They're going to condemn me to death. They're going to turn me over to the Gentiles. They're going to spit on me. They're going to mock me. They're going to scourge me. They're going to crucify me. And then I'm going to raise from the dead. And as we went through, we kind of jumped ahead and we looked at Matthew chapter 26 and 27 and 28. And that's literally how it happened, step by step by step. And yet even in the middle of that, after everything on that list had been checked off except the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the apostles still seemed surprised that Jesus rose from the dead. But part of what we talked about, and we've mentioned this over and over again throughout this study, you really walk away from this study understanding we are after the death and resurrection, and we're looking back on it. 
And it's really easy for us to look back on that event and go, how did they not get it? How did they not understand? Why couldn't they see it? But these people had been born and raised thinking about the Messiah was going to come and begin his earthly ministry and, and restore the nation. Oftentimes when you look at the stories and even when Jesus is interacting with his own disciples, you see a lack of understanding about what his long-term plan is. They know he's Messiah. They trust him, they believe him, but they just don't quite get it. And then you start to see some of those things fall into place for him. And as the Lord comes back, and as they're filled with the Holy Ghost, you see a change. Because now they understand it. Now they get it, right? Well, today's message is called A Mother's Request. And it is kind of, again, another example of days away from his crucifixion, days away from giving his life to pay for our sins. They still don't quite get it. And you see here, this mother... And it's not just the mother, it's a mother and her two sons. All three of them come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the other Gospels don't even talk about the mother. If it wasn't for the way Matthew recounts it, we would think it was just the two apostles themselves. But they're going to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and they're going to ask him a question that I think really reveals they still don't quite get it. So listen to this as we look at the rest of Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee, children, uh, the, the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of them. Now, this here again says that it's, this is the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons. With her sons sons. This is James and John, by the way. The book of, uh, I think it's the book of Mark where it actually calls them out by name. Uh, but in Mark, uh, I think it's in chapter 10, it talks about James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we desire. That's the way that Mark describes it, right? In Matthew, it tells us that it's James and John and their mother. And they come to him worshiping him. Listen, they know who he is. They understand him to be the Messiah. And they are, they are not, to some degree, right? It's not that they're trying to lift themselves up above him. They are worshiping him. They come to him worshiping him. But worshiping, desiring something from him. Right. It says in verse 21, And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on thy left, in thy kingdom. Now, I don't know how much time passed between verse 17, 18, 19, and then verse 20. There couldn't have been much time that passed between them because they are bound for Jerusalem. And within a matter of days, Jesus Christ is going to be crucified. I can't swear it's the same day, but the context would indicate it was pretty quick. Jesus is just told, now maybe the mother didn't hear it, but James and John just heard him talk about the fact that he's going to be betrayed, scourged, beaten, spat on, crucified, die, and then raise again. And now their question to him is, hey, when you start your kingdom, can I sit on the right hand and he sit on the left hand? Do you know what they're asking? What they're really asking for is the place 
of most honor. Right? Christ, outside of Christ, Christ is, they imagine in their mind that Christ sitting on his throne and beside him is one brother and the other brother on the other side. It's a place of the highest honor outside of the king. I mean, seriously, let's just stop and think about that for a minute, right? How would you feel? How would you feel if me and Josh went and said, hey, I know these others are really good people. They're great people. But how about if you just take the two of us and you just kind of set us up in front of everybody. We'll, we'll be your right hand and your left hand. I had Brother Philip. He's, he's an okay guy, but there's two spots in, in highest honor. How about me and Josh get that? I mean, after all, you know, John, he's kind of part of the inner circle, right? You know? Can't James tag along, the two of us, be right here up at the top? I mean, that's in essence, I don't want to paint too bad of a picture of it, but that's, that's in essence what just happened, right? Now, I love their zeal. I love a mom's love. <laughs> These are grown men. I mean, like, we're not talking like teenagers. These are grown men led by their mother to the Messiah who says, hey, can you give me one thing? Make my boys your two most important people. Now, on one hand, like I said, I'm, 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 trying, <laughs> I'm trying not to be too negative because, I mean, we're talking about they worship the Messiah. They view him as everything to them. And what better place of honor to be able to stand by his side and serve him. So, like, I'm trying to be careful, right? Because there is a, there is a worshiping that's in this request. But there's also a little bit of self-serving. And it also doesn't look very good to the other ten. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I think about the passage that talks about, you know, like, hey, don't sit at the head of the table in case the guy that comes in that's in charge tells you to get up and go to the end of the table to a lower seat of honor, right? I'm kind of picturing that here. Like, a better approach might have not been to say, hey, can you put us at the front? Let the Lord do that, right? You know, like, let the Lord say who is on my right and on my left. Um, but like I said, I'm also trying to be careful because, like, I get it. They worship the Lord. I mean, there's no disrespect or dishonor meant to him in this. I think it's just a misplaced question, personally. I also think it is a reflection that they probably still don't understand what he just said, dying and raising again the third day. Like, they know there is something different about this trip, right? You wonder if they couldn't feel the excitement in regards to the end is almost here. I almost think that some of them were beginning to think, I mean, he's talking about suffering and crucifixion and raising the third day. I don't really get all that. But you kind of get the idea that they think he's about to set up his kingdom. Like, it's close. It's coming. 
which I think is a good reminder of just how shocked they were when the Lord was betrayed and taken, right? Because they really envisioned that the, the, the kingdom was soon coming. Like, we're there. And then this request of, well, when, this, when you set up your kingdom, when your kingdom is finally in place, can James and John be at your side? Now, Jesus goes on in verse 22, and Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. You don't know what you're asking for. And if you did, you might not be asking. You know, we need to bring it, be able to bring our prayers and petitions and, and things before the Lord. But we also need to search ourselves and make sure we're asking for the right reasons. And understand that sometimes the way you think it might be, you know, they didn't envision. They didn't envision being at the right hand of the Lord in his kingdom. Um, it just wasn't going to quite be the way they thought. And the Lord said, you don't really know what you're asking for. He goes on, he says, are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, we are able. Now, it's commonly believed, and I, I tend to agree with this, it's commonly believed that what the Lord was talking about here is, <laughs> are you going to be able to go through what I'm about to go through? When he says that he's going to, can they take of the same cup and be baptized of the same baptism, he's talking about, I just told you that I'm going to be condemned to death and scourged and mocked and spat on and crucified. And you want to be on my right hand and my left hand. Do you think that you can drink of the cup that I'm about to drink of? Now, I love their passion and their zeal because their answer immediately is, we're able. Lord, wherever you go and whatever you go through, we're there. Yes. The answer is yes, Lord. That's basically what they said. In verse 23 he says, And he saith unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But it said on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Now to some degree the Lord comes back when they say, We are able. Yes, Lord. Where you go, we will go. What you partake of, we will partake of. He says, well, that's, that's actually kind of true. You, you will partake of my cup and you will partake of the baptism. You know, the apostles are going to go through beatings, mockery. They are going to be immersed in the contempt of sinful man. Now John is about the only one that lives too long, but even he went through some pretty horrible stuff, is what we're told from history. The Lord challenges them as to whether or not they can take of the same thing that he's going to partake of. They answer the challenge, yes, we will. And he comes back and says, well, you're, you're right, you will. But your request is not one that I am going to grant. Because his answer is, that's already been prepared. That's not something that somebody can just come up and request. This is something that has been prepared by my Father. And it's not something I'm going to give. Sometimes the Lord's answer is no. 
Sometimes the Lord's answer is no. And that's okay. You know, I see, interestingly enough, even though the Lord told them that, look, the position on my right and my left is not mine to give. It's been prepared by the Father. You know what? James and John kept following him. James and John kept serving him. James and John ended up drinking of a lot of the same cup that he partook of. It's okay. Sometimes the Lord says no, and we need to be okay with that. Now, I want you to put yourself in the shoes of the other apostles for me for a minute. We talked about this briefly a minute ago when we talked about, well, me and Josh, well, how would you feel if me and Josh went and done this? Well, now I really want you to put yourself in the shoes of the apostles. It wasn't that long ago that Peter raised his hand and says, what about us that forsook everything to follow you? What do we get? Do you remember the Lord's answer? Twelve thrones ruling with me. The twelve had already been promised a seat of power with the Lord. But now, if you were the other ten, it looks like James and John weren't satisfied with twelve thrones ruling with him. It's, hey, when you set up those twelve thrones, can me and John be right beside you? you can imagine that that didn't go over very well. If you look in verse 24, And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. Guess what? Somehow, some way, stuff always gets found out. The three of them went to the Lord and asked. The Lord said no, but whether somebody overheard it or James, John, or the mother was talking about it, I don't know, but the ten found out. And they got angry. <laughs> they got angry. It says that they were filled or moved with indignation. If you look that up in Strong's, it says, greatly afflicted. <laughs> Man, this bothered them really bad. You can imagine, how dare you? How dare you? <sighs> There's going to be 12 thrones. What makes you think that you've got the right to sit on his right hand and his left hand? Why do you think you're better than me? Well, don't you think I deserve to sit on his right hand? Do you see how quickly, in my mind, and maybe I'm misreading it, I don't think so. Do you see in my mind how quickly they got back to who's greatest in the kingdom? Wasn't that many chapters ago they were arguing about that. The Lord caught them. They were embarrassed about it. And the Lord called them out and talked about how that we need to treat each other. And that we need to be more like servants versus masters. Remember that whole dialogue? Well, now we're back with two of them asking to be right hand and left hand. And the other's getting mad about it. I'll be honest. I don't know that any of the 12 have the right attitude in this story. If the other two, if the other 10 had been in the right place, who cares? Lord already told us to not worry about who was greatest. I'm just thankful that I'm his. If those two want to go off and argue and debate about which one gets to sit in the right hand and left hand, so be it. He's already been more merciful to me than I deserve. Right? You see the difference? 
Man, it, oh, no, 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 not, no. <laughs> if, you got an, if you got an opportunity to ask, I need an opportunity. To, they're angry. We are, my guess, hours away from when the Lord told them, when we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be betrayed and eventually crucified. And now here we are back talking about debating who gets to be greatest in the kingdom again. I love the Lord's patience. I'll tell you, the Lord's patience with us is impressive. Verse 25, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. And it shall not be so among you, but whosoever shall, will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Once again, the Lord steps in, and he reprimands them. Now granted, he does it, I believe, gently. But days away from his death, and probably only hours after telling them, I'm about to give my life and die on the cross. And now you guys are arguing again about who's better and who best and who gets to sit at my right hand and my left hand. Do you remember, guys, what we talked about when we talked about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Do you remember how I talked to you about how we should treat each other? To some degree, what the Lord answers them is very similar to what he covered in that chapter several chapters ago. Man, these are my little lost sheep. These are the sheep that I left the 90 and 9 to go find and how I rejoiced when it was found. You be careful not to give offense to them. Or how about the unforgiving servant who was forgiven of so much and yet couldn't forgive a fraction of what he was forgiven? Those are the things the Lord talked to them about last time this whole debate came up. You know, as you think about these things and you see this attitude and striving, this is almost... Whether they're actively striving against each other, I don't know if I could say that. But there is definitely a, a jockeying or a pushing for who's going to be by his side. And the Lord called them to him. <laughs> I don't know. I just, as I imagine these things, I have to grin sometimes, right? You got these grown men arguing with each other. Wow, how stupid was that? Why'd you have to go ask if you could be at his right hand? And then the Lord just like, okay, guys, come on, come here. And it actually says that he called them to him. Come on, guys, come over here. Feel like I'm talking to a pack of kindergartners. Why don't you sit down in a little semicircle around me? I'm adding that. That's obviously not in there. But, you know, I mean, like, he's having to call these grown men to him and explain this again. You got James and John over here. I don't know. If I'm James and John, I'm, I'm both defensive and embarrassed and maybe a little disappointed. I've been told no. I'm not going to give to you the position of my right hand and my left hand. Now I got the other ten mad at me, and it's all public that I asked this question. And so I'm probably both defensive and embarrassed. 
You got the other 10, they're angry. Why would you even ask something like that? How dare you do that? What makes you think you can do that? And now you got these 12 grown men angry and at each other's throat, so to speak. And the Lord says, come here. Come on. Let's talk about this. And he says, you know, he says, guys, look. We live in a country that is controlled and dominated by a Gentile government. And you guys have seen enough of what goes on in the Roman government to understand the hierarchy and the structure and the jockeying and the pushing and the politics and the nastiness that goes on in trying to get to that next level. Listen, these people lived in a territory controlled by the Roman government. If you have studied anything about the Roman government, it was a political nightmare. People marrying people strategically to get this person on their side and that person on their side and divorcing this person to get this. I mean, horrible, horrible, wicked stuff went on all in the pursuit of getting just that little bit more leverage over the guy that's a step ahead of you. I mean, if you study the way the Roman government worked, I mean, man, it was bad. And when you got in power, you wielded that power. It became a thing of... You got it. Now you got to keep it. And the Lord is saying, look, you've seen this. You know how the Gentiles do this. They exercise dominion. I mean, we got the Roman government exercising dominion over us right now. But you've seen it. They exercise dominion over each other. And authority. Man, they rule with a rod of iron. In verse 26, but it shall not be so among you. Look, it wasn't that long ago you guys were arguing about who gets to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And now I got two of you asking me if you can sit on my right hand and left hand. Now I got the other ten of you upset about the fact that they asked if they could sit on the right hand and the left hand. You guys are acting like a bunch of Gentiles striving for power. It's not what I want for you, and it's not to be something that you guys are doing. It shall not be so among you. That is a command. It shall not be so among you. That is not what I want. He says there in the latter half of verse 26, but whosoever shall be great among you let him be your minister. Do you know the way I want it designed, guys? Do you know what my plan is? My plan is that those that are the greatest should be like ministers. You say, well, what does he mean by ministers? Well, if you look at the word minister, it means to minister unto. It's this idea. It actually is the word that's often used for to wait tables to wait upon. It's this idea of, of being a waiter or a waitress, somebody that is out to serve others. Steady you 12 debating and arguing all the time about who gets what. I want you guys to be focused on how you can serve each other. And then he goes on to verse 27. And whosoever shall be chief among you, let him be your servant. Now, it's a very similar statement. Um, whosoever shall be great among you, and whosoever shall be chief among you. Uh, chief kind of means foremost, right? The foremost, the first. First. 
Now, the first one talked about minister, and the second statement talks about servant. And so the principle and the concept behind those two verses is very similar. But the second one is almost a little bit, almost even stronger. Because the first one is minister, meaning uh, to wait or waitre be a waiter, waitresses, to kind of serve tables. The second one literally means a bondman. Like a bondman. I love the way Thayer's actually gives a couple different definitions of this word. And one of them says, devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interests. Not what I want, but what you need. That's that idea, right? And this is, he's telling them the foremost, the first, the one that holds the highest position among you, I want them to be like your servant. I want them to be of an attitude of, I'm going to set aside the things that I want, and I'm going to serve and help provide the things that you need. Even if it means sacrificing of myself and my own interests. Do you see how diametrically opposed those two things are? You can either be like the Gentiles and the heathens who are fighting and striving to see and always get one step above the other, even if i got to kick you in the head to get you down a little. Or you can actually look like the least among people, but in the Lord's eyes, you're foremost. I want you guys to be like ministers to each other. I want you guys to be like servants to each other, not masters. This, by the way, is very much uh, in John coming down again to the end of his life, only hours away from being taken in the garden. The Lord expands on this, I believe, in John, and he actually gives them this uh, example of where he sits and he washes their feet, right? We've talked about that often. This is the same principle, but Jesus this time, probably a, a few days from here, actually sits them down, washes their feet, and says, this is what I was talking about. Listen, I am your Lord and Master, and you, have, you are right in calling me that. But I didn't come as a mighty ruler demanding service to me. I came as one ministering to those that were sick, ministering to those in need. And he doesn't just tell them this. He uses himself as the example. He doesn't just say, hey, this is what I expect of you. He says, what I expect of you is for you to pattern your life after what I've done. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. He says, listen. You guys believe me to be the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Messiah. I didn't come to this earth and be a carpenter's son and live this almost nomadic life because I needed worship in this. Listen, he deserves all, all glory, all honor, and all worship, and he will get it. But he says, that's not why I'm here. I am here to minister to you. I didn't come to be ministered unto. He could have stayed in glory if he wanted that. Listen, I believe that before the Lord came, he has ministering angels. I mean, it, listen, he didn't come here to get more service. He left what he had 
to come here. He says, I didn't come to be ministered unto, but to minister. Again, that word minister means to serve or to wait tables. He came to minister unto us. But it doesn't stop there. He ends it by saying, and to give his life a ransom for many. In other words, 12, you want to be first, you want to be foremost, you want to be chief, then you be a servant. You be a minister. And listen, you can't be enough of a servant or enough of a minister. Because listen, I came to do those things and in doing those things, I am literally going to lay down my life as your ransom. I'm the master and yet I'm dying for you. You say, well, he hasn't died yet. No, he hasn't. But if they were listening, they would have heard that he'd already told them he was going to. Not long before this story, he had said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. You go all the way back to John chapter 3, where he talked about being lifted up. The Son of Man is going to be lifted up. He says, listen, this whole back and forth and debating who's better, arguing about who's going to get to sit on my right hand and my left hand, you guys need to get over that. You need to have my attitude of one that's coming to sacrifice much for others. Forget about yourself. Stop trying to strive and to be better than everybody else. You start focusing on how you can serve those around you. Because even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. He's giving His life. I tell you what, you think about some of the words that these men later would go on and write. I think about some of the stuff in the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, especially 1st John, where he talks about the love of God. You can see the imprint of the Lord's teaching on these guys. When they when the Lord is crucified and buried and then rose again, man, these guys, it meant something to them. They talked about how much the love of God was, how he, what He had done for them, and how that we need to have that love to each other. It's really, really pointed in John when he's talking about washing of feet. He says it here. First John is full of it. The Lord's command for us is that we need to be like ministers to each other. John, when that account is given in John, it's even declared that it's through that that people will know that we're His. Those are some of the most condemning words. And you say, whoa, no, that, that's an encouragement. It is until you, until you see just how much some of the Lord's churches fight and bicker and argue and jockey for position. And yet our Lord's own words while he was here 
was people will know you by the love you show each other. If the 12 apostles who were with the Lord Jesus Christ day in and day out for almost three years struggle with this, don't lift yourself up so high you think you can't. But also learn from their mistake. Learn from these examples. Head the stuff off before it gets there. And I'm going to even say and go out on a limb, listen, we need to fight against that attitude in the Lord's church. I think there's too many of the Lord's churches that have not fought against that attitude. And it takes root and it expands, and it gets worse. You need to be watchful for this, and we need to cut it out early and make sure that we're looking at each other like those little lost sheep that the Lord left all to go find. I need to treat you like that, right? You need to treat each other like that. That's what we want. All right. We're going to go ahead and stop there. Brother Philip, if you would, come and lead us in.